Well, good morning, everybody. We're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulty, but we'd like to welcome you to the Shiny Apps IO Overview and Tour uh, presented by Tarif Kouaf, our president at our studio, and Andy Kipp, our lead developer on Shiny Apps IO. The presentation will take probably about 45 minutes, uh, but we're reserving 15 minutes at the end for any questions you may have. Please don't hesitate to ask the questions, however, in the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can also feel free to uh, tweet at uh, our studio, hashtag our stats. Uh, and again, we will, um, we always post the recording on our website at our studio slash resources slash webinars. We're, we'll try to post it within 48 hours uh, just so that you can review the uh, overview uh, at your leisure and share it as much as you'd like. Uh, so just to keep you in the loop, we have a whole bunch of upcoming activities. If you go to our website, you can sign up on one, any of the panels. We have these email boxes sitting all over the uh, rstudio.com. Uh, but we do have a very interesting webinar coming up next week with eWay on HTML widgets. It's going to be very interesting. We also have a roadshow in progress currently. Uh, there is a March 6th uh, event in Boston. You can find these on our, um, on our website as well uh, that still has space available. But again, uh, the, uh, the West Coast is coming up in the month of April. We also have a March 25th uh, spots available with one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with Hadley Wickham in San Francisco. And we'll share this in the recording so you can get to all these links. Again, to keep current, you can look at news and events on our website, and we have the recordings posted on rstudio.com resources webinar. Great. Well, um, we uh, I wanted to run everybody through the uh, the agenda of what we're hoping to cover today. The uh, we're going to start out at the very basics and sort of dig in deeper as, as we go along. My goal is actually to leave us more than 15 minutes for Q&A because I expect that, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we can have an interactive discussion here. Um, so the you should, you know, hopefully you'll get a feel for how Shiny Apps get built, uh, get the, the get, get a good sense of what accounts are, what authentication means, uh, how you tune your apps, uh, how do you figure out if there's a problem, um, Maybe spend a little time on the on the plans, make sure that people have a good sense of what that is, and uh, and sort of answer some uh, some of the most commonly uh, asked questions about when should people deploy on Shiny Apps IO. So, uh, so let's uh, let's run through uh, what what is what is the flow of uh, of creating an application. So, I uh, I've created an application here on my R Studio, uh, you know my R Studio IDE, and it's a it's a very simple application. That um, that you know sort of does what you would expect it to do. It's it's using the shiny dashboard package that we uh, we talked about maybe about a couple months ago, and uh, and so you can see that this is working locally just fine, right? This is running in an R instance on my own machine. Now, um, I had I have separately created an account on Shiny Apps IO um, that. Um, that I registered using my own personal email address, and so hopefully people will not abuse that uh, on this call. Um, and uh, in this particular case, um, once once you've created it, the first thing it does is it gives you sort of the instructions that you need to be able to, to deploy an application. And once you've deployed your first application, these instructions go away, but you can always see them uh, on the guide on the website. So I've actually uh, taken the steps here of installing DevTools, installing the Shiny Apps package, uh, and authorizing my account inside of my uh, RStudio instance. And, and you don't have to be running the RStudio IDE. This works with any version of R. Uh, so as long as you have the package installed, uh, you can deploy your application from, from anywhere. All right. So what's going on here, just so everybody is, is aware, is we are, the, the package itself goes ahead and takes a look at the, the directory that you're in and uh, scans the, the R files, looks for dependencies, takes a, takes a look at, um, you know, sort of all the, all the files in the directory, bundles them together, then uh, communicates to the service and sort of pushes that application up. Once it's complete, now that application is running uh, in the cloud. So behind the scenes, uh, what happened is the, the file was the the, pa the bundle was packaged uh, from my machine, sent up to the cloud. It was rebuilt in the cloud, 
And so this is an important concept for people to, to recognize is that uh, this application, which looks identical to the one that we were looking at a moment ago on my own laptop, is now running, uh, if you take a look up here, uh, at, a, at a URL in the cloud that we're sort of managing. And uh, uh, my, this particular uh, email address has an account, Mr. Shiny, um, and uh, you can see the application name is uh, First Dashboard, which is, if you take a look at my files, uh, you'll see sort of contains uh, the server.r and the ui.r that we're looking at here. Uh, the, uh, there's a little Shiny apps directory that gets created here, which is sort of tracking uh, uh, various information about the, the upload to the service. Once I have successfully uh, uploaded this application, so oh, sorry, let me. I want to spend a little more time on sort of the build process. So, when when the service receives uh, that bundle, it actually goes ahead and recreates that application. So it, it rebuilds all the R packages that are needed, um, uh, bundles it all together, and essentially creates what we call uh, an application instance. And so. Uh, so it's a bundle, I should say, and that, that, that can be uh, when it when it comes to life, essentially comes up as a as an application instance, and we'll talk about uh, those details a little bit later. Um, and that we take care, Shiny Apps IO takes care of sort of taking that bundle, putting it on the multiple machines, uh, uh, have, making sure that we can sort of recreate it on the fly, uh, running it on servers that that are in multiple uh, availability zones. I should mention that we're today deploying our entire infrastructure on Amazon's web services. And so that's a cloud provider that, uh, that would then allow us to sort of uh, scale it uh, on demand, if you will. All right, are there any questions that are worth answering? Okay, let me, uh, so once I've, once I've deployed my application, refreshing it would, um, you know, would, would sort of bring up this page. And so you can see here I've got uh, I've got three states for applications. One is, is running, um, and since I only have one application, you know which one is, is actually running. Uh, I thought I'd spend a little time explaining uh, the differences uh, in the states for applications. So a running application is one that is is currently uh, um, alive, if you will. It's, it's receiving traffic in some capacity. Uh, a sleeping application is an application that uh, that has been sort of uh, that has been idle or for for some amount of time. And, uh, and we put it to sleep because we want to conserve resources. We have you know, several thousand people that are using the service. Um, and in order for us to be able to, to offer it for free uh, to some and, uh, and at low prices to those who need the more advanced features, uh, it's, it's vital that those resources sort of uh, not be wasted, essentially. Uh, archived applications are, are ones that you have decided uh, you no longer want to make them available to the world at large. So there, there could be other multiple reasons why you would want to do that. It may be because uh, you know you have you're in the free plan and and you want to stay under the five you know to keep the, the five active apps that you want to use, uh, or it could be that you don't want to sort of waste any traffic any of your active hour uh, allocation uh, to those applications. All right, so let's uh, let's dig in to a, a given application. This is this is going to be sort of one of the most important pages uh, for for you guys to be aware of. So for any given application, you can take a look at uh, the various information associated with it. Uh, here's the URL that would sort of bring it up uh, to the world at large. Uh, you have the status, uh, the size is uh, is how much. So we have different uh, uh, instance sizes that you can run your application in. Uh, by default, it is the medium sized, and for the free tier, uh, that's the largest size that you can sort of upgrade to. And um, uh, the the other important settings here that I want to sort of walk you guys through is around. Uh, let's see. Is around application visibility. So, um, so applications by default are publicly visible. So that means anybody who has my URL can can go ahead and access it and, and play with it. Um, if I wanted to, I could make that application private. And when I do so, that uh, that makes it so. In this particular case, the only person that could see this are people who are in the account itself. Um, but and so in saving it, for example, causes that to um, uh, redeploy uh, the application, or restart the application, all server side. This is you don't need to redeploy it from from your own application, from your own uh, IDE. 
And now I have an application that the only person who can see it is, an, is, uh, is myself. I could now add additional users by specifying their email addresses. So in this particular case, I'm going to add my own personal email address uh, at work, my work email address. And now if the user that you have invited does not have uh, a Shiny Apps account, um, then they will they will get an invite to sort of create an account with the service uh, that primarily for view for, for viewing purposes. So let's go back. Uh, hopefully that covers sort of the, the gives you a sense of the life cycle for a for shiny, for shiny apps for shiny app package being created. Uh, let's spend a little time sort of talking about how you know what 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 are the, what are accounts what are users what are viewers uh, and, and sort of spending a little more time on, on the authentication piece since uh, that's something that that comes up often so I mentioned that uh, that I've invited this particular email address when I when I do that uh, they've they if they already have an account on shiny apps IO then they will just get a message and, and they'll be able to click directly through and, and see your application by authenticating when you when you look at uh, authentication we actually support three different ways of, uh, of authenticating somebody. So uh, the, the most common one that people use uh, usually falls into logging in with their Google authentication system. And, or if you have, uh, if, you have uh, if you're using uh, Google's stack at work, for example, if your email provider is Gmail inside of work, you can log in with those Google authentication credentials uh, there. Uh, you can log in with GitHub if you're using GitHub. And then uh, finally, we support uh, what we call local authentication. So this is a username password pair that you create that is running on. Like we, we uh, Shiny Apps IO is the is the provider for that. And so uh, one of the key concepts that I want to make sure people people understand is that uh, there's a separation between you can have you could you can have multiple um, ways of authenticating against the same account, right? So um, and, and we'll take a look at what that looks like in just one second. So if I log into my account and I click on the uh, account section and I click on the profile, uh, you'll see here that I'm using uh, uh, Google Auth, but there are these buttons here around link account um, and I can enable password authentication. This is the local auth. And so what that means is I can, I can go ahead and say this particular um, uh, account can you know I have these three different users that I any of them when, when they authenticate would go against this particular user. Uh, I wanted to spend a little time sort of making sure people got a sense of uh, the the various uh, uh, components of the service that that sort of impact performance right and so uh, to help you know we've we've created a doc, uh, a doc that is is linked uh, from from the shiny apps page so. Um, if you are visiting uh, Shiny Apps IO in here, you can um, you can find this link here. Clicking to scale to, to learn to read more about scaling and performance tuning. Uh, this is just straight off of rstudio.com/products/shinyapps. And um, and similarly on the authentication side, you can read more uh, under under uh, the uh, Product Shiny Apps page. So, but uh, but let's spend a little time sort of talking about performance and, and sort of the key the key concepts that you have to, to play with uh, when when you're thinking about tuning your application. So, when you when you've created a bundle and uh, and now uh, you know some you've made you've made the application available and a request comes in, what Shiny Apps I will do is it will take will create an, an application instance essentially. It'll start it up uh, for you. And uh, a request coming in from a web browser will uh, will get sent to an R process. So what we call here an R worker, uh, our worker, uh, and um, and so depending on the settings that you have, and we'll run through some of those settings right now in the advanced tab, you can control how many uh, uh, connections you have open to a single R process, how many R processes you want to run in a given application instance, and how many application instances uh, uh, you can run. Again, I would encourage folks to sort of read through this doc if you're, if you're interested in learning uh, more about uh, how this works. 
And, uh, and obviously, if you guys have questions or if there's some uh, things that need clarifying, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us in general uh, on the Shiny Apps users list. Uh, we're, we're, it's very active, and we want, we want that to be a place where we can always be having a conversation with you. Uh, but let me show you uh, a few of those settings uh, in the dashboard itself. So if I go back into my application and I click on my settings, um, you'll see some important concepts here. So the uh, instance size is one where uh, you can control how much RAM is allocated to a uh, to your application for on a per application instance basis. And so, if you have uh, you know set an application that is uh, playing with 200 megs of data, you know, and and you may be making copies of that data uh, a few times, then you know. Uh, the, the medium instance may not be sufficient since it comes with only 500 uh, megs of RAM. Um, the the larger instances uh, sort of come with with additional RAM, and we're we haven't finalized what we think the numbers are going to be, which is one of the reasons we don't sort of list them here. Um, today, there's no uh, uh, there's no CPU difference in terms of like what you get for the different instance sizes. That might change in the future, so that's that's also why we're intentionally vague on this. Um, Andy talked about the instance idle timeout. So this is this is the amount of time before uh, we would sort of shut down uh, the application if it hasn't received any traffic. And those are what we consider sort of basic uh, settings uh, relating to, to tuning and performance. There is a more advanced tab here uh, that that allows you to really fine tune things if you if you know what you're doing and you know what you what you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, so by default. Um, the the medium instance will start up with uh, three. Uh, well, it'll start up with up to three. Uh, it'll get up to a maximum of three R, R processes, um, and each of these R processes can handle 50 connections. Right. So if you are building an application that's very computationally intensive, for example, you may not want all of those. You may not want 50 concurrent users on a single R process because R itself is uh, single threaded. And so that that would mean that if, if you have something that let's say a, a computation that takes five seconds, uh, and you have ten people sort of requesting that, the tenth person is going to have to wait um, uh, 50 seconds before before their request even gets in there. I.e., so they would uh, so the average wait would be 30 seconds uh, per per person, which is which is too long. Um, and so, so you can control how many uh, connections you would allow, and that sort of really governs. Uh, coupled with the with what we call the, the the load factor, the worker load factor would govern sort of when a second R process would start up, right? And um, and there are settings here that you can have for for sort of cutting down on the the connections. And so if somebody has a web browser, they open an app and then they just walk and get a cup of coffee or they go for lunch, you may not want to have them count against your R processes. And so you could you could sort of play with the timeout sessions there. Um, we have additional timeouts here for, uh, um, you know, for, for how long to wait if an application is not able to connect to various data sources, or it's not able to load files, or if it's it's particularly computationally intensive at startup. Uh, you can sort of tweak these settings. We try to pick settings that we think uh, will work for the vast majority of people, but uh, we recognize that people create different kinds of applications and such may may need uh, uh, different features. The uh, similar to the um, the, the worker load factor, there's an instance load factor, and so this is a uh, case, again, going back to the diagrams that we have here, if, if I'm running with uh, one instance and uh, let's say I get to the max of three R processes, uh, there is the threshold at which I would want a second instance to come up, and, uh, and that's, that's what those settings are really uh, meant to help handle. You also can control how many instances you would want to start up at, in the beginning, uh, this is useful if you are building applications that you think will get uh, flash floods, essentially, where you don't want, uh, you know, you may you may be willing to run with uh, a larger number of, of connections per uh, worker uh, per hour process, but um, but you'd rather not have any slowdown, right? Like if you know you're willing to go to five instances, then um, then you could say, you know what, just start me up with three. Or four or five or however many uh, uh, you think are 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 needed, and you can control uh, how many instances here uh, through on the front page essentially of the application view. Where uh, if I press the plus button, that now has has will say, okay, I can I can sort of do two uh, application instances.
So hopefully that gives everybody a feel for some of the tuning parameters. We can get we can dig into this more um, on the uh, in the Q and A uh, portion. So I wanted to spend a little time talking about uh, troubleshooting. What you know there are um, you know typically there are a few places where people uh, can have issues. Um, uh, Andy mentioned about the fact that you know we will bundle the entire directory that that you have your application in and ship it up. Um, and so what that means is if you have a read CSV or read TSV or read it, you know if you're reading a local file of some kind, um, and uh, and you're not and you're not using relative paths, right? If you're using absolute paths, um, you know the when you push that file when you push your app up to Shiny Apps IO, you we don't have that file anymore, right? We only we may not have that file, um, and so the the, there's a linting process that we've implemented in in um, in the package itself that tries to detect those cases, and uh, and sort of hopefully prompts you to say, hey, listen, are you sure that this is the right, you know, that this is this is what you want, um, and um, so that you can hopefully catch those issues. Um, but if you if you don't, um, then uh, then the easiest thing to do to try and debug these issues, frankly, is is to use uh, the, the show logs call. So if I if I go in here, I can type um, you know, and that will return uh, the log of the of the running instance. Uh, similarly, I can I can do the same thing here in the UI uh, by clicking on logs, right? So that gives you visibility into what's going on. Um, the other really valuable uh, thing for people to be aware of is that uh, if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm trying to debug an application, sometimes what you want to do is, uh, is take a look at what is called the JavaScript um, uh, console uh, in your in your browser. So um, and and you know, reloading it sometimes will give you the data. You'll sort of spit out the errors that might be occurring that you maybe didn't see uh, when you were running locally. Uh, so again, referencing uh, relative paths is, uh, or absolute paths versus relative paths. Uh, out of memory is a, is another thing. Sorry, uh, the out of memory issues that uh, can sometimes occur because maybe on your laptop you you have a four gigs four gigs of RAM and you know by default the application instance that we start out with is is 500 megs and so uh, if it runs out of memory you'll see uh, you can see sort of an error uh, in the um, you know in the browser sometimes I think. Is, is the best place to see it right now. We're going to be working on actually making this something that's visible uh, in in the UI, uh, but that is something that bites people sometimes. Uh, two other uh, the locale differences is something that that actually is probably one of the more common things, and it's something that is on our plate to try and, and ease the pain on. But if you are running in a different locale, uh, sometimes some packages uh, will not behave properly because of the locale that we are running with on. Uh, on the server side, so in, in on Shiny apps, and so we're going to be adding a little more work here to see if we can uh, correctly determine the right locale and uh, uh, that you're running with to sort of replicate that on the server side. Uh, uh, sometimes we see people with uh, uh, time zone differences, where like you know the package is not you know maybe the package that you're using is not taking into consideration uh, uh, the, the time zone, you know, sort of using the time zone of the machine and, and maybe you were expecting it to be using your own time zone and so you just need to be aware of the fact that you're not deploying it on your machine anymore. You're not running it on your machine, you're running it on another machine that's in a different um, uh, zone. Um, there are cases uh, where there are R packages that require operating system level libraries to be installed that maybe we don't have installed. Um, that has uh, that was sort of an issue in the early days of the alpha and the beta. I think that the, for the most part has not come up recently. Uh, that being said, uh, I wanted today to just show you guys that we actually have a package. Um, we have a we have a sort of a GitHub repo that you could um, that you can go to and, and put in some you can file a GitHub issue for um, that tells us hey listen you know what for this package I need X Y or Z um, and then once you do that that will allow us to sort of um, uh, triage them and hopefully pull them into the service and you will have a, you'll have that that'll close the loop and give you a feel for when those things are now available uh, on the service. All right. Um, Use of native code. All right, so this is this is important. We've we've had some people say, listen, you know what? This runs really well on my Windows box, 
and now I push it up to uh, Shiny Apps and it breaks and it's because it's calling some uh, 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 .exe uh, program, right? Or I'm shelling out to some some program that that uh, is uh, is not available. Or sometimes I say, oh, I've got I put it in I put it in the directory um, and, and pushed it up, but it's not working. And so and and so the thing again, this is highlighting the important uh, concept of when you push things up to, to Shiny Apps I/O, they're no longer they're not running on your machine. They're not running on your operating system in all likelihood. They're actually running on uh, uh, Linux. Uh, and uh, and so if if you if you need to be using native code, then Shiny Apps may not be the right uh, uh, solution for that. Uh, Just to kind of qualify that a little bit, um, you know, packages with native code, yeah, that's right good. on a CRAN or on a GitHub, you know. May work on a case by case basis, but well, most of them usually do work. Everything on CRAN should work, but um, with yeah. the qualification about the system level dependencies. So, really, this is sort of like um, a really nice case around people who are trying to shout out to EXE files and Perl scripts and some sort of really non non standard stuff. So, all right. Um, We've we've had a, f a couple of people sort of uh, highlight uh, custom fonts, like you know fonts that that maybe not. Uh, uh, that are not installed on server. Well, we don't have a solution for that right now, but you know, obviously, we'll uh, we're, we'll look at that. And um, and then the other thing that that people get bitten by are our private packages. We'll talk about that a little bit in terms of talking about what's coming down the road. But uh, this is an area that we are uh, particularly passionate about uh, solving because uh, there are quite a few people that are interested in either running with um, uh, packages that they've uh, that they have. The source of on GitHub, but in private repos, uh, or ones that they don't have anywhere else except their own systems, and they won't be able to, to run them there. So we have a free plan. Uh, the free plan is, um, you know, obviously open to everyone and anyone. Uh, we do have some limits on that, uh, so that you know we can uh, we can operate a business ultimately. But um, uh, so you can get you start off with five applications. Uh, you have a limited number of active hours, and um, and the support that we provide is is only community support. And there's uh, our studio branding that is turned on by default there that you can sort of opt out of. Um, then we have three other commercial uh, plans today that uh, uh, that are sort of targeting different kinds of audiences. Uh, in each of them, you know, you have the flexibility of, of starting up multiple instances. Uh, you have a, a much more generous uh, allocation of active hours. Uh, you have email support. And, uh, and no limits on your applications. Uh, I don't know if anybody's asked this yet, but um, on the active hours, one of the questions that we get asked uh, is, you know, what happens when I hit my limits on active hours? And so, for the free tier, um, the the applications stop today. Uh, for the commercial, for the for the uh, commercial tiers, um, our intention in the future is to uh, look at a sort of an overage model of some kind. But we have no intention of doing that anytime soon because. Uh, we want to really get a better sense of the usage of the system uh, at scale. We we don't feel like we have enough data today, um, and so those are those are our best guesses today. And so we'll operate that probably for three to six months before we before we look at what what the right numbers should be, um, and we'll tweak them accordingly, obviously. Uh, and if you want to read more about any of these, uh, yeah, I, I strongly encourage you to to take a look at the um, at the at the homepage here. Um, of, for uh, for shiny apps, and there's a there's a comparison sheet at the very bottom that gives you uh, a sense of sort of you know deploying your own infrastructure versus uh, uh, running shiny apps IO and and what are the what are the key differences uh, there. All right, so we've been talking about all the cool things in shiny apps IO. I wanted to actually spend a little time talking about why you shouldn't use shiny apps IO and when you shouldn't be using shiny apps IO. Um, so. Uh, the way to, to rationalize and think about this is if you have any kinds of restrictions on uh, your data leaving your firewalls. And so, if you decided to, you know, um, you know, you want to access a database that is not open to the outside world, or you need to, uh, you need your authentication to somehow be uh, uh, your LDAP server or Active Directory that, uh, you know, or um, uh, your data set size, your, your data set sizes maybe are, are too big for you to push up to us, right? Or your computational needs are too high, or you have uh, very specific compliance-related uh, uh, requirements. I mean, today the services is still relatively new, as you guys all know, uh, and so uh, 
um, we're definitely not in a position to be able to support like HIPAA or other um, other compliance standards out there. So, um, and then uh, uh, and again here where if you if you somehow need to be running uh, packages that need Windows uh, or Mac, you know, executables or whatnot, then that this is not a, the the right solution for you. Uh, alternatives for almost all of these uh, would be to either run your own uh, open source Shiny server. Uh, or to run uh, the pro product of, of Shiny Server. And uh, uh, we have links here for you so that you can explore them further to get a better feel for, uh, for what would be useful to you and your organization. All right, so with that, we officially get to the uh, Q&A portion of the program. Uh, do, do we get any more questions since then? Several, we have several. Um, one question was about uh, custom compiled code inside the application, and so, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, but uh, you mean like RCUP, uh, then that should work. Um, custom uh, packages on GitHub should work. Uh, as I mentioned for another question, we currently support packages from Quran, Bioconductor, and public GitHub repositories. Um, gonna, as Treat mentioned, we're going to be looking at adding support for private GitHub uh, repositories and potentially other package sources as well. Probably pretty soon. Um, another question uh, was uh, any thoughts around creating a slightly lower than basic around ten to fifteen dollars per month? Yeah, actually, that's uh, so we we went out with this proposal. Uh, so far, we're still learning. Obviously, if you have suggestions of what what would be useful to you, we're 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 open to having a conversation and learning more. Right? There's um, this was uh, this was our first guess, and uh, and we're you know obviously learning about what what the market will bear and and how do we build a business that's uh, that's actually viable. Um, another question here was uh, are math libraries uh, included? Uh, Intel math libraries. So oh, like the BLAS like or whatnot? Yeah. yeah, we actually, we were talking about whether we should try and do something there. We, we actually haven't uh, uh, bundled that in. Um, it is a thought. Yeah. It is a thought. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'd love to hear, you know, for, for folks who are interested in, in things like that, we'd love to hear uh, those requests. Um, and uh, it'll, it'll help us sort of triangulate and see how, how, uh, how common that, those requests are. Right. And sort of what the use cases are, right? So, I mean, it's you know, if if, if people are looking at at needing you know clusters and, and massive computation, then that's not Shiny Apps IO. It's not today the right platform for that. Uh, you know, not to say that we don't want to grow into that in the future. So, but uh, but I want to I'd love to sort of understand the use cases behind it. Cool. So a couple more questions. Um, uh, we signed up for a non-free tier. Are you locked into that for a certain amount of time? Uh, no, so, so you can uh, subscribe for any of the plans on a monthly or yearly basis. So if you choose to go uh, monthly, you can cancel or upgrade, downgrade, uh, whatever you want. Uh, if you go yearly, uh, it's a, um, it's for a year. Yeah, it's for the year. It's for the year. Um, one question here, or perhaps a comment, is uh, uh, if that would be possible to make an app private even on the free tier, um, but some of the signs make it look like that won't be available. Uh, unfortunately, that is true. Uh, in order to have a private application, you have to be in the standard tier or higher. Uh, we got a couple questions here also about um, databases. So I thought I'd just reiterate them. Um, you can access a database from Shiny Apps IO. The only uh, consideration is that the database has to be accessible from the Shiny Apps IO servers. Um, so sometimes people have had success. Uh, hosting their own database, you know, MySQL or Postgres or whatever, on um, Amazon on their own Amazon server or DigitalOcean or some other, or configuring you know their corporate firewalls to allow shiny servers, uh, shiny servers, shiny, excuse me, shiny app servers to uh, reach that database. So it's entirely possible and can be done securely using HTTPS or using a TLS. Um, so it's just a matter of making sure that your database. Uh, the Shiny Apps I.O. servers can connect to the database. We've also had people with success using um, some other alternative database, NoSQL databases, such as Mongo. There's a number of um, you know, uh, providers where you can get hosted Mongo solutions. Um, 
something like also using Amazon RDS, which is a hosted um, you know, database solution as well. Uh, oh, so there's one question here. Uh, can you use our Markdown document to incorporate Shiny inside of, in, and host inside and host that one Shiny on SIO? The answer, uh, I believe, is yes. 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 That's how our board deck is. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, we do that. Yes, that's entirely supported. So if you have an R Markdown document, uh, that uh, also works. Um, it's very slick if you're uh, using the IDE as well to deploy those. So if you haven't, not running a recent version of RStudio IDE, it makes that very easy. Um, so the first question we had uh, was, was will a sleeping application awaken if a user goes to your URL? The answer is yes. So an application initially is deployed, obviously uh, it's running. Um, after a configurable amount of time, the application will go to sleep. Um, Currently, the default is 15 minutes, so if nobody's visiting an application for 15 minutes, it goes to sleep. Um, if a user was to visit that application uh, another time, go to that URL, what they'll see is a little message saying that uh, we're waking the application up in about, uh, I think it should take about 30 seconds, the application um, becomes alive again. Uh, we can yeah, we 15 can minutes later, it will, it will go asleep if nobody's using it. We could demonstrate that right now if people want. Uh, I, could put, I could put this application to sleep. And... Uh, you sure? Um, well, while Chris doing that, the second question was, uh, what is the idle time needed that services to put that to sleep? Uh, the default, as I said, is 15 minutes. Um, Sharif can also show up. Um, Sharif is now showing uh, what happens when you go to a sleeping application. You see the please wait screen, and then we go ahead and we, we start that guy up again. Um, what do you do if you want to have C++ code, C++ code run while attached to R via RCP? Since it appears that only two files are uploaded, UI.R and Zipper.R. So this sort of talks about like how deployments work. Yeah, yeah, I think I'll just reiterate what Drew was saying earlier. And the basic gist is when we look at an application in a directory, there's two files, UI.R and Server.R. Um, the Shiny apps package, what it's going to do is it's going to analyze those two files and look for the application's dependencies. So it looks, basically what it looks for is calls to library, calls to require, uh, triple colon, a double colon, uh, package dependencies. Uh, so as part of the deploy app step, we gather all those dependencies and we make them in a list and then we upload that along with UI.R and server.R. And any other R files. And any other R files. And anything, anything in that directory. Anything in that directory. Yeah, files, anything in that directory. Yeah. All that gets uploaded to uh, the Shiny app servers. From that list of packages, which we call the manifest, uh, as Truth mentioned, we're able to recreate the environment that uh, uh, you you had on your uh, local machine. So we do we match version, package source, uh, pretty much everything as as best as we reasonably can um, to try and recreate that local environment. Um, so the short answer to your question is yes. If you have a package that you load in via RCP. That's fine if you're using RCP, RCP, Armadillo. Any of these will work um, as long as you have the appropriate library or require calls inside your application code. Um, I hope that answers the questions. Um, uh, one question is, uh, are all applications deployed with a free account uh, visible to the world? Uh, so that you sit here, uh, there's a difference between the free and the basic account. The basic account uh, is a paid account. Free is obviously free. Only applications deployed to um, the standard plan and higher are entitled to use authentication. So we'll cover, we'll cover, we'll cover that yeah. later, but the answer is, is uh, uh, yes. Uh, can these uh, be embedded in HTML page? Absolutely. Uh, people use uh, Shiny apps and they embed it into iframes. It works quite, quite well. Yeah, if you go to shiny.rstudio.com, you'll see an example of that on the very front page. So yep. this is shiny.rstudio.com. You can see that this is a Shiny application and it's literally changing as I make these changes. So if you look at the source of the HTML, you can literally copy exactly what we've done. Uh, on the back end, uh, are you leveraging container technology? Uh, yes. Uh, 
another question here. What is the best way to use private cloud storage to store information across different sessions? Uh, E.g., Google Drive, Dropbox, Amazon S3. We actually have an article, I believe, on our on the Chinese Dev Center that talks about different methodologies. Um, I will find the um, the link for that and drop it in there. Um, yeah, the drop the Dropbox one. I know that there's a there's a package that was just recently created. It's gonna it's undergoing one more change um, to sort of make it uh, you know, sort of make it a little bit more aligned with what Hadley's been working on with HTTPR. And that should be coming out shortly. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure that that gets covered. The article that uh, Andy's referring to sort of talks about uh, uh, data connectivity. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Dropbox is a common use case, and we'll we'll make sure that we get an article up and running once once the once that package is revved. But for those who are interested in checking it out right now, you can let, take a look at uh, our drop. R D R O B. Another okay. question: Do you support biofactor packages? The answer is yes. Uh, we said uh, packages from CRAN, Bioconductor, and public GitHub repositories are all supported. Private GitHub repositories are coming shortly, and then uh, followed by arbitrary. Package sources after that. Is there support for multiple R markdown files in one Shiny app? Yes, but it's a little tricky because you need to know the URL. You need to know the 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 the, the ending, right? Yeah. Like you can put them all. Um, you can put, you could have a directory that has like five R and D docs and deploy them all as one app, but then you have to clap, you have to, when you when you access it, so let's, like, to go back to my example here, you know, I have first dashboard, you know, then there would be, you know, like, app, let's say, doc one. Right. We don't uh, enumerate the, the, right. the URLs for each document inside of the application. We can probably look at enhancing that support later, but yeah, it's entirely supported. You just have to make sure that uh, you know the URLs. Because we only we don't enumerate them if there's multiple markdown files inside of one app. Uh, question is, uh, is there uh, example somewhere of an RMD in a shiny doc? Not one that I can show you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yes, it should be pretty straightforward. I think there might be some on the R markdown. Oh, maybe, Website. maybe, maybe, yeah. yeah. Uh, how does Shiny app? I mean, we could create one right now, I suppose, if we want it to be really adventurous. <laughs> how do Shiny apps handle a uh, pack rat project? Uh, we're actually working this right now. We don't really support pack rat right now, in the sense that if you're using pack rat to manage your package dependencies, we sort of uh, don't really look at those snapshots. Uh, we're working right now with the pack rat guys uh, within our studio to try and figure out uh, what the integration is going to look like. Um, but we entirely, but we fully intend on supporting that, and, and um, as an alternative, or in conjunction to, or in conjunction with uh, our existing package dependency uh, system. Um, so, hope that answers your question. Uh, so, there's a, some question here. Some packages from Bioconductor Access website. Uh, databases like uh, UC or UC uh, SC um, would that still work? Uh, yes and no. I, we've had some some bio people had trouble with bioconductor packages because they're trying to pull it in, in very large data sets, um, and they've hit some of who uh, has issues with timeouts. Um, so I want to answer that question as uh, maybe uh, if you trying to pull in a, a package from bioconductor. And it's not working. Uh, you know, do reach out to us, and we'll take a look at it and see if there's something we can do to, to, um, to fix that. Um, for the most part, it should work. But like I said, very large packages uh, containing very large uh, uh, data sets could be problematic, and uh, such something to be aware of. Uh, oh, jeez. What, what is the range of start time to expect for sleeping apps? Uh, uh, what is actually happening in the background when that happens? Um, it's a good question. We usually uh, we have some metrics here, um, but I don't know off the top of my head exactly what what we, see, we typically see. But uh, I would say certainly less than 30 seconds um, for most of the time. That can be affected as if you have um, are doing a lot of initialization inside of your application code. For example, your you know, pre-processing a data set, 
or you're uh, pulling in something from some external place, um, that can slow down application load time. Um, but in, in, uh, for most applications, it's relatively quick. Uh, I see a question here. I did notice a place to set an app, or did not, did not, didn't notice a place to set an app password on Shiny Apps IO. Um, what you can do is you can enable uh, your application to be private, and then you can then add users via email address to uh, that application. We don't allow setting a password, like a, like a single password or anything like that. Um, previously on the alpha, we uh, had the ability to do that, but we since deprecated that, so it's no longer supported. So if you want to have um, an application that has password protection, what you need to do is set it to private, and then go ahead and add the users that are um, you'd like to have access. Um, in general, what tips do you have for debugging when, say, an app is running fine locally, but it may hang or time out in Shiny SIO? Uh, show logs is uh, really helpful. Um, if you're not already using that, um, you can, that basically captures all the output from a running Shiny process. Um, also, as Trief mentioned, going into the browser, your browser, and doing the JavaScript log, that can sometimes yield errors. Because you got to remember that there's there's JavaScript running on the browser, and there's also um, the R code that's running on the server. So those two errors can appear on both in both uh, instances. Also, reach out to us. Uh, we're we're happy to help. Um, Making the hurdle from going from a local app to an app running in the cloud sometimes requires some different thinking, and, and it's not always clear uh, where those things are. Uh, does uh, Shiny XIO support custom URL? Uh, this is a feature that we're going to be introducing into the professional tier. Um, so you're allowed to have any sort of a, a custom URL, you know, yourname.com or whatever, whatever, whatever you wanted. Um, but again, that's the feature that we're going to add to, to the professional tier. Uh, can the addition of users with access to a private app be automated? In other words, is it possible for a developer to construct an automated user creation interface? Uh, I'll say maybe. <laughs> with this one, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to give the ability to add users via the Shiny Apps package. Uh, so um, they'll provide a couple of different um, uh, things that you could do to do this. Uh, you, if you had a list of uh, uh, users that you wanted, to, the large list of users you wanted to invite, you could use the Shiny Apps Packages uh, functions to do that. Um, also, you'll be able to say, if you want a custom, uh, if you want to send custom invites, uh, invite text, you can also do that as well in the Shiny Apps Package. So that's coming soon. Uh, so there's a... Um, do a plug here for the uh, Shiny Apps users discussion list. Uh, if you go to the Shiny Apps uh, IO website, you'll find a link to um, our Google discussion group. Uh, we welcome um, you guys to join that. Uh, get in discussion. It's a pretty active mailing list, and uh, Tree and I monitor it very closely, trying to help anybody who's having any issues, has any questions. So um, I'll point you guys there for um, you know. Any questions, getting any help, wanting to reach out to us? Um, yeah, so just to sort of close out on, on the, uh, the question, somebody asked about having multiple RMD docs in there. And so you can see here, both of these are under the same app, SimSilly Sim RMD, and I have two radically different uh, docs in here, right? So it's obviously uh, very doable. Uh, let's run through uh, a few of these things. We talked about them, so uh, we're going to be extending the, the Shiny Apps package itself to make it easier for you to uh, add users and potentially send them invites uh, uh, yourself, so that you can sort of customize them any way you want. You can describe it, you know, have your own branding, etc. Um, but then ultimately, they still will have to have an account on our service. But this gives you sort of a, a way of of uh, explaining what you're doing. Um, uh, support for private GitHub repos we've covered quite a bit. Um, the improvement on detections of uh, application locale, uh, private R packages, um, su uh, supporting for application deletion. This is something that's been brought up a few times, uh, and we want we want this all uh, um, for folks. And um, uh, we've also gotten requests where people want to be um, able to to download their application because they may have lost it uh, from the time they download from the time they uploaded it, uh, or they're not using a source control management system, which um, um, 
which would have it, you know, chat at the information then. And then, uh, and, then ob and then the other thing, obviously, is as, as we get more and more users that are getting into scale, we want to be able to give you more information so that you can uh, uh, dig into what's going on. I didn't actually cover the metrics tab at all, but it sort of gives you a feel. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it makes sense to quickly show you what that looks like. Um, but, you know, you can, you can go ahead and take a look at um, the metrics uh, for your application, how many connections were open at a moment in time, it just keeps wanting to come up. I don't know why. Um, and um, and the memory usage and uh, um, and the network usage for your application. So, all right, that's all we got for you today here uh, from Andy and I. Uh